just uh, quick instructions. My name is Martin Sloan. I'm one of the partners at Brodie's in the um, commercial services team specialising in uh, data protection. Long going to be presenting today alongside Grant Campbell, um, who many of you will, will know, who's also a specialist in data protection law here at Brodie's. So the, the format today was um, fairly similar to what we've done before. Um, I was noting when preparing for this, this is our, our second webinar in the second time we've done our six monthly update as a webinar. Um, the first one was back in uh, May, just after the, um, not long after the start of lockdown. And here we are six months later, uh, still doing this as a, as a webinar. Um, so it seems apt that we will kick off with talking a bit about COVID-19 and some of the data protection issues that that has raised and what we're seeing um, you know, in terms of what clients are, questions they're asking and what they're having to deal with. I'll then hand over to Grant to talk a bit about uh, ICO enforcement actions. So some of the, the big cases like BA and Marriott. Um, the next section, uh, for those of you who are active in social media, um, over the last 24 hours, um, this one's had a bit of a rewrite because uh, there are some exciting new developments in the last 24 hours, um, which has meant we've had to play around with things a wee bit um, just to keep this up to date. So um, some Easter eggs in there in terms of what we'd originally thought we might, might cover and Grant will take you through that. Um, then go on to look at uh, some of the regulatory guidance that's come out from the ICO and the European Data Protection Board and uh, touch on Brexit as well. Um, we're now six, seven weeks away from the end of the year. So what uh, do you need to be thinking about um, if you're within scope for that? And then finish up um, with our usual on the horizon in terms of things that are, are coming down the track. Okay, so I'm going to kick off uh, talking about COVID-19 and some of the things that we've been um, dealing with over the last uh, few months. And for those of you who were with us in May, you'll remember that we, we talked about some of these things um, back then. And I think it's maybe just worth recapping on, on some of this and, and some of the newer things that come out, particularly because we've now had some guidance uh, from, from the regulators on some of these issues, whereas last time we spoke, uh, that there was no guidance. So one of the things that's come up is the, what employers should be doing in terms of employees working from home. Um, how do you monitor the, that your employees are working um, effectively? How do you, do you keep an eye on them and um, make sure that they are um, get everything they need to do, uh, that there aren't any, any issues in terms of productivity and things like that? And so the ICO has provided some, some guidance on this. And yeah, the, I think the thing here is there are many, many systems out there which you could use to monitor key, um, keystrokes or to um, view screens or do things like that. But the starting point, I think, from this has to be thinking about, well, what are you trying to achieve with this? You know, are you monitoring performance? Are you checking quality or the quantity of work? Are you looking to improve productivity? You know, what, what's your basis for doing this? And how do you ensure that the, whatever it is you want to do is, is both necessary and proportionate? So um, you know, is, is the proposed monitoring that you want to carry out a proportionate way of, of achieving that? Is there a less intrusive way of actually carrying out um, that that monitoring? Um, do you need to use you know, intrusive technology like um, keystroke or, or IT monitoring software? And I think with this, it's always helpful to go back and think about you know what what you'd have done in the office environment with your workforce in terms of what monitoring you carry out there, and then think about how you might replicate that um, in relation to the working from home environment. And if you're finding that you're doing something that's far more intrusive, um, working from home just because you you know, have access to technology, and that probably is an alarm bell that might not be the might be the right thing to do. But what what you should I think be doing is looking at uh, what you're trying to or what you what you did previously and how you can replicate that. So really important here to you know, think about the the impact on uh, employees' rights, um, other consequences such as potential discrimination, um, and other matters and then weigh that against what you're looking to achieve and carry out your data protection impact assessment um, before deciding what to do. And, and as with everything, being transparent with your workforce, explaining what you're doing um, is absolutely you know, fundamental here and, and important. The second COVID issue that we, we've had, and I think I mentioned this in our, in our May update, is around workplace testing. Um, and again, you know, the, some organisations are looking to carry out their own COVID-19 testing um, of, of their workforce um, to, for health and safety reasons or, or to, to reduce the risk to, to employees. And, and as with employee monitoring, again, the key here is looking at what might be proportionate and, and necessary for what you're doing. So you know, 
if you're looking at carrying out tests, look at who, who you're going to wanting to test, what parts of your workforce are, are you know, are you looking at? Is it particular groups of people who are particularly high risk, or where, for example, social distancing might um, might not be possible? What sort of frequency you're carrying that out at? Um, carry out your your impact assessment. You know, think about that. Think about your legal basis for this, um, and work through through that. And consult with your workforce. You know, develop a privacy notice and share that to ensure you've got your workforce on board with this. And one of the really interesting things that has has emerged over the last couple of months is different countries are taking different approaches to this. So in the UK, the, the Information Commissioner is is on board with the concept of work of employers doing workplace testing where that's necessary. If you go to, to Ireland, then the Data Protection Commission there seems to be much more hesitant about it. Um, and there are wider issues there around, you know, for example, certain constitutional rights that individuals have in, in Ireland, which would allow them to object to, to testing. So if you're a multinational organisation, then just be wary about not necessarily applying the same um, policy in, in all the countries in which you operate, because there, there will be national variances. If you're engaging a third party testing provider, then look at your contracts for that and um, check their expertise. Um, there's some really useful guidance from, um, it's published by the Department of Health and, and Social Care in England, um, which is quite useful. And it highlights, for example, some of the things to think about around um, the sort of accreditations or certifications that you want to get from your, your testing providers as well, in addition to just the data protection issues. And then finally, on, on the test results themselves, you know, think about who gets access to the test results. Um, what are the, the consequences of a positive test? Um, how are you communicating that to, to your workforce as well? Um, you know, any, any test result like this will be special category personal data, so you'll need to think carefully about who has access to it. Um, is it just provided to the, to the employee? Is it provided to HR? If so, how and when is that done? Um, and again, there's some interesting experiences from across the IDC in terms of how that has been done um, with government provided testing um, and some of the, the issues that the, the Irish DPT has, has raised on that. Then final point in this slide, just around contact tracing and other tracking technology. We, we've seen a big um, boon in terms of people who are offering, you know, um, wristbands or other things that uh, will alert people if they get too close in the workplace. Um, some of these can have genuine application. They can, you know, they can be helpful if they if they remind employees that they've been too close to someone for too, for too long a period of time. But there are other systems like this which actually allow employers to track where their employees are moving around the workplace, and um, you know what part of the the workplace they're in, how long they're there. And that is far more intrusive technology, and I think you know, to be used with extreme caution. Um, just because it's available on the market doesn't mean to say that it's, it's appropriate to use. So, again, as with everything else, think about proportionality, think about necessity, carry out your data protection impact assessment, and think about your legal basis before you before you deploy this. In terms of home working practices, yeah, th this is all obvious, fairly um, obvious stuff, but. I think it's a good time just to refresh your, your policies and your procedures. Um, think about you know, if you've got people who've been working from home for a long time, um, IT, IT security in terms of what, what they're doing. Um, do they have, for example, you have guidance on people having smart speakers in their in their working environment? Should they be switched off? Um, are they are they using their own their own devices? Are they using uh, devices that you provide? Do you need to tweak or amend your, your security policies to deal with that? If you're allowing people to print at home, um, what's your policy on that? How do they dispose of confidential information? You know, some people may have been working for home and printing out large amounts of information. What are they supposed to do with that? Um, can you provide them with technology that means that they don't need to print, for example, a, a second screen um, that reduces that risk? And the other one that we're seeing a trend on is, is around software use. So you know, many workers will, will be looking at what they can do to you know, other tools they can use. They may be using um, video chat platforms that you haven't you haven't uh, authorized, or things like WhatsApp or other stuff. So think about you know, asking people: Do you know what they're using to communicate? Are there are there gaps where you need to look at that and think about providing an approved solution rather than having people doing doing their own thing? Um, it's just worth I say looking looking at all these things. And then finally, on on COVID nineteen, for those of you who are in the hospitality sector um, or in certain other um, parts of our business here, you operate facilities like um, leisure centres or, or um, 
hairdressers or other close contact areas, there is guidance um, from the Scottish Government around collecting contact information. And as of a couple of months ago, that's now a mandatory requirement for, for the hospitality sector. But for other areas, it is just a requirement under guidance. So it, the provision of that information is is voluntary. And, and that's really important to understand because you, that then impacts on your legal basis. So if you're in the hospitality sector, then you have a very clear legal basis for collecting this information. You're, you're looking at Article 6.1c of GDPR is to comply with your, your legal obligation. But if you're not in that sector, then you're going to have to think about what your legal basis is. And the Scottish Government has uh, provided a template privacy notice. It suggests that organisations rely upon legitimate interests for collecting this information. But remember with legitimate interest that at the end of the day, it's down to the controller to actually make that legitimate interest impact assessment and consider what they're doing versus the impact on, on the individual. So it's important just to not take that template as, as being a statement of the law and actually think about what you're doing, how you're doing it, um, and ensure that you, you're putting in place appropriate systems and, and policies to collect that information in a, in a lawful way. And as in both cases, you know, the, the requirements around data, data retention and to keep that secure. And we've, we've seen a number of press stories around uh, workers using that information for um, inappropriate purposes. So just make sure that your your workforce is properly trained on on what they should and shouldn't be doing with that data, and not, for example, using it to contact customers or dumping it all into a into a marketing database. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, Grant Campbell here. I'm going to talk a little bit now about ICO action. Um, so there've been a number of significant decisions over the last few weeks. Uh, starting with a couple of very significant monetary penalty notices. So we start with the first one, which is BA. So you will recall some time back now, the summer of last year, the ICO uh, levied a notice of intention to fine BA almost £190 million uh, as a result of a cyber attack, which involved about 400,000 of its customers and staff and included names, addresses and payment details for about 250,000 BA customers. The outcome has been that a monetary penalty notice has been levied, but at a much lower level than was indicated last summer. So the figure was 20 million pounds. Uh, now, it was clear from a very lengthy uh, monetary penalty notice that the ICO considered that BA had failed to take appropriate measures to prevent a mitigate attack, particularly around the lack of controls uh, within the, the systems, both in terms of uh, the perimeter security, but also once the perimeter defence was breached, uh, within the actual systems themselves. So the, the, the monetary penalty notice is clear that there was a failure to take appropriate measures, but the fine was much, much less than the ICO had originally indicated. So how was the fine calculated? Well, the starting point... Uh, was £30 million based on the breach, its scale and severity. I'll talk a little bit about that starting point in, in a few moments. Um, as a result of BA taking uh, appropriate mitigation steps after becoming aware of the breach, the fine was reduced by 20%, which brought it down to £24 million. Um, and then as a result of the ICO's policy on the economic impact of COVID, which would be particularly, I think, uh, relevant to, to airlines, the fine was further reduced to 20 million pounds. So much lower than originally, than originally trumpeted back in the summer last year. The second monetary penalty notice relates to Marriott Hotels. So back in again in the summer of 2019, the ICO indicated a notice of intention to fine uh, Marriott Inc, about £100 million as a result of a cyber attack, which compromised a record of about 340 million customer records worldwide, 30 million of which were in the EEA and 7 million in the UK. Uh, and again, that compromised names, addresses, email addresses, and a lot of pass passwords, uh, and a lot of information relevant to the, the hospitality sector relating to individuals. And again, the ICO in the monetary penalty notice found that um, this, this hack uh, had been because, or, or had been partially caused because Marriott had failed to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures, including insufficient monitoring, access controls, 
and only limited use of encryption. So how was the fine calculated? Well, the starting point was 28 million pounds, again, much lower than the 100 million that had been uh, suggested earlier. And as a result of mitigation steps after becoming aware of the breach, that fine was reduced to 22.4 million. And again, as a result of the commissioner's policy on COVID, that fine was ultimately reduced to 18.4 million pounds. These monetary penalty notices, if you read them in totality, the two of them run to about 200 pages of text. So that I think there are some general themes that come out of those monetary penalty notices that are worth exploring. So I think what is clear is that the ICO's approach and thinking on fines has been developing. So the basis for selecting the initial level of fine isn't entirely clear from the monetary penalty notices. But if you look at the draft statutory guidance on regulatory action, which Martin will discuss later, uh, we can begin to see how that may have been calculated. Uh, the ICO has been keen in both decisions to stress that mechanical comparisons with other fines are not appropriate. So it's not a case of saying, well, actually, the number of records was X. In another case where the number of records was Y, you only find them so much, why are you doing this to me? The ICO is saying, look, each fine has to be dealt with on a case by case basis. And in applying the methodology and the fines and the monetary penalty notices, the ICO has been meticulous in applying a five stage process, which is set out in her regulatory action policy. So five stages are to remove the financial gain. So if there is any gain made as a result of what's happened, that, that gets, um, calculated in. Uh, you censure the breach based on its scale and severity. You then consider whether there are any aggregating factors. Consider whether, to what extent you need to make a deterrent message from the, the fine. And then finally, you apply any mitigations and hardship issues. So those were the five steps employed. It's clear from both uh, monetary penalty notices that it pays to make representations. Neither BA nor Marriott have taken the fine lying down. But I think what they also have done is actually they've cooperated in terms of taking all of the actions that the ICO thought were required to remedy the, the breaches. So prompt and effective mitigatory and remedial action is important. In the monetary penalty notices, the ICO has been keen to make clear that she is not applying hindsight. So the fact that an attack was successful doesn't mean that there was necessarily a breach of data protection law. But she was also keen to stress that organizations, particularly those of size and profile of BA and Marriott, should be aware that they're likely to be targeted and the attacks may be sophisticated. So the fact that an attack was sophisticated in itself is not unexpected. Um, the absence of intention is not a mitigating factor. So the fact that both breaches were negligent rather than intentional doesn't reduce the level of fine. It's just not an aggregating, aggravating factor. Uh, it's also clear in one of the monetary penalty notices that the fact that security was being provided by a third party, a reputable third party, doesn't, in her eyes, uh, reduce culpability for the data controller for what has happened. I, I think it's also um, one, in one case, there was a lot of reliance on uh, PCI DSS. So encrypted data around payment data, but the ICO was keen to stress that actually her expectation is that an appropriate, appropriately non-payment data will also be encrypted too. So P, PCI DSS is important, but don't lose sight of the wider issue of the data that you hold. And, and then finally, there was an argument around whether or not this was a tier one or a tier two fine uh, on the basis that Article 32 is a tier one uh, offence. And what the commissioner said there is Article 5, so the basic responsibilities of data controllers, is also engaged. So this is a tier two infringement, although the levels of fine that were actually um, levied probably wouldn't have taken, wouldn't have gone beyond a tier one fine anyway, given the turnover of the organizations. Moving on from those monetary penalty notices, there have been a number of other investigations and, and regulatory action, and we've just picked out a couple of them. So Klarna is a Swedish fintech. It provides 
checkout services for online operators, retailers. And in that case, uh, there have been a number of complaints by individuals that they had received Klarna's uh, marketing newsletter when they'd had no connection with Klarna at all. Um, Klarna has said that the email was sent out by mistake, but individuals are wondering why Klarna had their details anyway. I suspect it has been as a result of Klarna or individuals using Klarna to make the payment on the website. Uh, but again, you know, the using um, people's emails for direct marketing has to be properly authorised, either in terms of consent or in the UK, some form of soft opt-in. So it'll be interesting to see Klarna's fighting its corner. It'll be interesting to see what comes of that. Uh, rather uh, worryingly, the Department of Education has been subject to a compulsory audit by the ICO. I think it was around concerns about the National Pupil Database. And the findings uh, from that compulsory audit are, are you know, quite stark. 139 recommendations with 60% of them given high priority. And you can see from the slides that some of the failings are really quite significant. So no proactive oversight of information governance, uh, culture and attitude, lack of training, uh, no record of processing activity, which is an Article 30 requirement under uh, GDPR, uh, and other policies lacking in detail or not in place at all, including DPIAs, lack of transparency, and a lack of oversight over data processors. So it's clear that even in government, in, there are still lots of places where um, improvements need to be made. So it'll be interesting that that report was uh, published in October. So it'll be, it'll be interesting just to see how that flows from there. Uh, finally, uh, Experian. So there was an investigation by the ICO into a number of credit reference agencies, Experian, Equifax, and I think a third one, uh, TransUnion. Uh, and the concern here is around their credit broking um, arm. So what had been happening, I believe, is that these credit reference agencies were obtaining data in the course of their statutory credit reference functions, and then using that data to enhance other data that they had, which was then being sold on to third parties who were using it in marketing lists for marketing purposes. So it's enrichment of data and described as invisible processing because it was lack of transparency to the individuals that this was happening. And in the case of Equifax and TransUnion, I think the results of the investigation were accepted and they implemented the, the changes recommended by the ICO. But in the case of Experian, um, the ICO didn't think that what Experian had done went far enough. So after a number of months, at the ICO has issued an enforcement notice. And I think the, the issues that are around lack of transparency, so actually, the, the privacy notice that's issued to individuals and where information about this sort of processing is contained. So I think it was buried deeper into the privacy notice, the layers of the privacy notice than the ICO wanted, but also um, about how Experian was justifying its processing, both in terms of the application of the legitimate interest test and the balancing of the, in the interests of the individual but also switching a legal basis. So starting processing on the basis of consent and then that morphing into legitimate interests. So SHREMS too, as Martin uh, mentioned, uh, we've had to do some hurried rewriting of our slides overnight as a result of guidance that's been issued by the European Data Protection Board. Uh, we've covered the actual decision in SHREMS to uh, in previous sessions, both on webinar and we've also blogged on it. So I'm not proposing to spend too long on the actual detail. Um, the, out, the, the For the purposes of what's going to follow, I suppose the important bit was out of the, the Schrems 2 decision, uh, standard contractual clauses were held to be valid, but because they are contractual guarantees, the European Court said they're not alone sufficient do you have to look at the wider landscape of the country to which the data is being exported? And if those, if that legal system would overwrite the protections in the, the standard contractual clauses and the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, then you may need to look to put in place additional safeguards in order to be able to, to use 
those standard contractual conditions. And we've been waiting for guidance from the regulators as to what's, how they view this requirement for additional safeguards. So if we turn the slide. So yesterday, the European Data Protection Board uh, issued, issued guidance. It is subject to public consultation, but it is, it is quite interesting in terms of the, the, the views expressed. So starts off by recognizing the challenge for organizations. There are no quick fixes, given the diversity of countries to which data may be exported. Um, and identifying the supplementary measures that will be required, and whether they're required, will have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. So the, the guidance says there is no one-size-fits-all solution. The guidance then sets out a roadmap with six key steps that it expects exporters to follow when uh, considering to export data outside the EEA. Uh, I'll take you, they are relatively self-explanatory, but I'll take you through them very briefly. So step one is know your transfers. So ensure that you have over, uh, full oversight of your transfers, including what data has been transferred to where and to whom. So you need, to, you need to have a data map and you need to have a destination map to know where the data is going. You need to identify and verify the transfer tools you're relying on. For example, if you're relying on an adequacy decision or standard contractual clauses, binding corporate rules, whatever, or even Article 49 delegations, although they are only likely to apply in very, um, very specific circumstances. If you're relying on an Article 46 transfer tool, so in this case, standard contractual clauses, you have to assess whether it is effective in providing in the test coming out of SHREMS is essentially equivalent level of protection to that under EU law. So does the law or practice in the country to which the data is being exported undermine those safeguards afforded by the standard contractual conditions? If it does, takes you on to step four, you have to identify and adopt, if necessary, supplementary measures. Step five is considering whether there are any procedural steps. Once you've put those additional measures in place, perhaps to notify a regulatory body. And then step six involves, you've got to continually revisit these decisions. And if things change, then you may have to revisit the safeguards and revisit the decision to export the data in the first place. So moving on, what the guidance says is you need to know where the data will be exported, where it will be located and processed. And it's not just a case of considering the immediate data importer. If that data importer itself uses processors, then you need to consider where these, those processors are. And if you have a long supply chain, then actually it makes the analysis of the requirement for safeguards uh, really quite complex. Secondly, uh, the guidance specifically calls out remote access from third parties, and it says specifically for support, and also cloud storage outside the EA as being transfers for these purposes. So if you export data for these purposes, if you allow people to access data within the EU for these purposes, then this guidance is, is relevant and SHREMS is too. And then the guidance emphasizes that steps three and four, so that is relying on your, 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 your tool and whether it's effective, and then whether you need supplementary measures. What it says is this is a matter for due diligence for the exporter. And the regulatory expectation is that any assessments that are made will be documented thoroughly, and if required, made available to regulators. It seems crystal clear and the guidance again says this, that exporters are going to need guidance, are going to need support from data importers in order to be able to understand the, the regimes against which these data importers are actually uh, operating. And you may want to uh, enshrine in your contracts what the data importers have actually told you about the regimes they're subject to. Annex 3 to the guidance references high level sources of information about third party laws, but it is very, very general in indeed. So I don't think it will be a substitute for getting appropriate legal advice from these law, from, uh, law firms in these jurisdictions as to what the regime actually says, but there is some guidance. 
In assessing third country surveillance laws, the European Data Protection Board has also published essential guarantee recommendations and I've attached a link to them there. These are the things that the board expect exporters to think about in actually analysing what they've been told about the laws of the countries where the data is going to be imported. The guidance says that supplementary measures can be contractual, they can be technical and they can be organisational. But it goes on to say that contractual and organisational measures alone are unlikely to be sufficient to overcome legal, um, legal systems where gov government can regularly access data. So that suggests that technical um, supplementary measures are likely to be the most effective in those scenarios. Examples of possible supplementary measures are contained in Annex 2 to the guidance and also commentary from the board as to certain scenarios in which they think some of these supplementary measures will be effective and also examples in which they think it would not be effective. So it's a toolkit together with some examples where the, where the board thinks these measures may be effective and where they may not be effective. And clearly um, what the, the guidance says is you have to pick the supplementary measures that address the specific deficiencies that your due diligence has identified as a result of looking at the legal systems where the data is to go. If you add supplementary measures to your standard contractual conditions, you do not need regulatory approval. But if you start modifying your standard contractual conditions or, or derogating from them, then they will not be effective. And finally, the, the, the kicker in this is if you determine that actually you're not able to implement supplementary conditions to ensure that essentially equivalent level of protection, you should not export the data. And if it turns out due, after you've exported it that you can no longer rely on these uh, supplementary measures, then you should repatriate the data. I just very briefly, I'm, I'm conscious of time, uh, I will very briefly just mention, I think, the Hamburg decision. So these are decisions of regulators to fine around Europe. The, the H&M one is, I think, significant. So for, for HR teams, if you're doing return to work interviews of your staff, you need to make sure that there are appropriate controls and policies around those and that those who are actually doing them actually know what's expected of them, what their data protection obligations are and that the data, only data that is relevant is collected and it is shared only on a need to know basis. So in the H&M case, uh, it was a very informal process, people who were collecting information well beyond what was legitimate, and then that data was being shared and used for purposes that individuals would not expect, the result of which was a 35 million euro fine. So, I think that's me. I, I pan back to Martin. Thanks, Grant. <clears throat> so I'm going to look at uh, over the next couple of slides some of the new guidance that we've had come out from the the ICO and uh, the European Data Protection Board. First, one to mention is just on the data subject access request guidance. So we've spoken before in these updates around some changes that were made last year around um, clarifications and whether or not you can start uh, stop the clock. Um, manifest excessive re request, etc. The, the ICO has, in the back of a consultation earlier this year on, on the guidance, um, made some very helpful changes. And I'll just pick out the one in relation to stopping the clock for clarification. So previously, the ICO had said your um, one month time period for responding starts when you get the request and you can't stop it from making clarifications. It's now moved away from that and has said that there will be situations in which you can actually seek. Um, clarification but only only in two cases so so firstly where you genuinely need to clarify seek clarification in order to respond to the request and secondly where you process a large amount of information and what what's going to be a large amount of information will depend on the nature of your organization the size of your team dealing with ESARs and, and other factors but there's an example in in the new guidance in relation to doctor surgery where someone sends in a DSAR for all information that's held a very common request um, but actually the, the doctor's surgery process is quite a large volume of information. And the surgery could carry out a reasonable search, but that might not actually provide the information the requester is looking for. So they, they say in that situation, you can go back to the, 
the uh, applicant and you can ask them to clarify and confirm exactly what information they're looking for. So I think this is, this is a really positive development um, in terms of dealing with DSARs because this is an issue that comes up quite a lot. And I think it endorses the, the approach of the controller taking the lead in terms of saying, we got your request, we hold a lot of stuff, and here's here's how we are proposing to carry out a search and what we consider to be a reasonable search, and then putting the onus back on the applicant to say, well, actually, that, that's not the information I'm looking for, and to say what it is that is required. So some very useful stuff in there. Also some um, clarifications around manifestly excessive uh, requests, um, which just say that you uh, you, know, you need to carry out an assessment to do this, take account of all the all the facts and circumstances to determine whether or not that request is manifestly excessive. And then on charging, we've got a bit more guidance as well, where the ISO is now explaining what reasonable fees might include. So that may, might be the cost of your staff time, uh, copying postage costs, um, copying to USB devices, that kind of stuff. Um, so in, in those limited situations where you can charge, we've got a bit more guidance on what that involves. The second bit of guidance I want to talk about is the draft statutory guidance on regulatory action. So this is the one that Grant alluded to earlier when he was talking about the, the BA and Marriott fines. So this is the ICO publishing for consultation its proposed approach to um, carrying out regulatory action. And, and the really interesting bit there we got um, up on the slide, which is a, a table showing how it comes up with the numbers that it proposes to, to fine organisations, the starting point. And what you can do with the BA fine is you can reverse engineer the figures that Grant was talking about. And we know it's a, um, in the higher maximum amount, so that's a 4% or 20 million euro category. We know the number is about 1.5%. So we know, and we also know that the, the breach wasn't intentional. So we can determine from that that the ICO in the BA case concluded that uh, this was a negligent breach by by British Airways and it was on the, the high level of seriousness. It wasn't very high, it wasn't the top one, but it comes in high. So quite quite a useful one if you're ever asked to try and you know assess the potential risk um, of, of uh, personal data breaches or you know, when something's happened, this is a good way of you know, trying to work out what it might mean for, for your, your organization. The age appropriate design code. So this is something which um, was consulted on a while ago. It's now into its 12 month implementation period. It's a slightly curious document. So the, it, this is not a requirement of GDPR, but it's something which is un, required under the um, Data Protection Act 2018. It was introduced as an amendment when that bill was going through Parliament. Um, and it, 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 it's a slightly curious thing because much of what it requires um, reflects what's in GDPR, but some of the stuff goes, goes beyond it. And what it's trying to do is apply a set of design principles to providers of what are called information society services. Um, so basically any online service. And while that only applies to services that are likely to be used by children, actually that could be very broad. So you know, there are many, many services which which could be used by um, by children online. I see a lot, a lot of this just reflects what's already in GDPR, um, but there are some additional bits such as the first duty, which is to act in the best interest of the child um, being your your primary consideration and that should shape everything that you do in terms of your your approach to how you design your online services so it, it is something which you know if, if you if you have a presence online you provide any online services um, you will need to look at whether the code applies to you and then think about what steps you might need to take to comply we've got a, a useful blog on on the, the blog uh, on this um, with a bit more information I mentioned briefly there um, Criminal offence data, the ICO has provided some updated guidance on this. It doesn't really tell you a huge amount. Anyone looking for um, the answer to whether or not you can carry out uh, criminal records checks on your employees and some very clear guidance on that uh, will be disappointed because the, the ICO doesn't uh, provide any, any clear guidance on when that is or isn't appropriate. So unfortunately, we're still all left to work out what our legal basis is and decide when and it is and isn't appropriate. Go on to the, the next slide. And then there are three bits of uh, guidance there from the um, European Data Protection Board. So first, we've had some updated guidelines on consent. This just really mirrors a lot of the ECJ decisions that we've spoken about before, but um, just emphasizes that if you have cookies or other tracking technology on your website or in your app, then you have to give people a free choice so that you can't use a cookie wall to determine, um, to determine uh, control access to it. 
and also saying, and, and as, as we all know, this shouldn't be a surprise that scrolling or swiping or continuing to browse is not an indication of consent when, when you're online. Uh, we've also had updated guidance on controllers and processes and joint controllers. Again, the, this just catches up with the ECJ decisions we've spoken about before um, around uh, particularly Facebook um, and the Jehovah's Witness cases, um, just emphasising you know, that the, the concept of joint controllership is, is a very broad one and you need not actually be processing or have access to any information to be a controller or a joint controller in relation to that. So worth having a look at that. Again, we've got, got some updates on, on the website on that. And then finally, um, the EDPB has also published some guidance on targeting social media users as well uh, in terms of um, targeted advertising and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is, is on the slide there. And I'll just move on to the final section, crunch the time just on, on Brexit. Um, and just a reminder again, we, we've spoken about this before, but uh, we're now uh, six, seven weeks away from the end of the year. And we don't yet, still don't know whether the European Commission will uh, be making a finding of adequacy in relation to UK data protection law. So if you are in the position that you receive data from the EU, whether from a, another company in your group or because you provide services to them, then you need to start thinking now about what, what steps you do, you put in place to deal with this. Standard contractual clauses are the, the most obvious remedy for this thing to do, but all the stuff that Graham was talking about in terms of the SHREMS 2 case will apply equally to um, transfers from the EA to the UK. So if you're a UK based organisation and you're importing data from the EU, you'll want to think about UK surveillance laws um, and understand what of those you're subject to and what your, your supply chains are subject to and what you can do about that. Also remember that if you provide services to the to customers in the EU um, or you monitor their activity or you act as a processor for someone in the EU, then you may well be caught by the extraterritorial provisions of GDPR. You may need to appoint an EU representative um, in a member state. You may be dual regulated. So there's lots of stuff there to think about if you are in, in that position. You've got a link on the slide there to our um, Brexit and Data Protection Guide, which is some checklists for different organisations, uh, depending on what it is that you uh, you do, whether you're a, a controller or a, or a processor. Okay, so I'm just going to the time um, and we've got our usual on the horizon slide, but I think I'll just leave that for you to read um, when you get the, um, the slides after, after the event um, in terms of what's on the horizon. And maybe we'll just go to uh, the questions in the in the last couple of minutes there. So um, just looking at the questions here, we've had two come in. There's one of them around smart speakers in the home um, and the risks there. So I, I suppose the issue is if, if you are uh, an entity or an organisation that's handling particularly confidential information or, or large amounts of personal data, sensitive information, then it's important to be you know, just aware of the risk that smart speakers can sometimes end up recording stuff in the background and um, that can then end up on servers of you know whether it's Amazon or or Google whoever is providing that service so yeah there's an information there we, we, we have seen cases reported of that where that information has been accessed by by employers of those organizations so it's just thinking about the risk there perhaps advising your staff to, to switch off the smart speakers if they have one in their the home working space uh, just to try and manage some of the risks there uh, and then we have one more question just around um, COVID testing for uh, students. Um, and I think that's one that um, if you can perhaps send us your, your name, we can we can follow up with that one afterwards. Um, if that's something you want to, to follow up on, I think that's probably a bit too much detail to go into in the, the time that we have remaining. So I think if we've got no further questions, uh, that just leaves us to say thank you for joining us today. There was some links there to our, to our blog, um, which has updates on a lot of what we covered today. Um, and please do also sign up and to receive our um, email updates as well that we issue when, we, when we're commenting on, on these issues. And uh, we hope to see you again in a, in a few months time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.